On the progress that's being made in obtaining compensation for the family's victims, uh, we are joined now by uh, Siri attorney uh, Zamandungwa Kumalo. Zamandungwa, good evening uh, to you and uh, thank you for your time. Uh, you heard uh, what uh, the minister says. Uh, she says there's the funds that have really been dispersed. She says there are efforts uh, not only on uh, the platinum belt, but even in the Eastern Cape where so many of these mining families originate. She says a lot of the Farlem Commission recommendations are being put into effect. Is that not enough? I don't think that's enough. I don't think some of the things that she said are things that we've seen happen. Um, just today, one of our clients was saying how much, how poor she is. She's hardly had, she hardly has any food for herself to eat. So I don't think, maybe they've been in touch with some families, but not the ones immediately that we have contact with. Um, in relation to the compensation, as you said, yes. Um, in terms of the loss of support, we have reached a settlement with the state, but there's still two remaining heads of damages that we've not reached settlement with. All right, uh, just unpack it all for me because the number of figures being floated around yeah. is 100 million. She's speaking about 70 million rand or thereabouts. Yeah. AMCO, of course, are saying uh, they don't accept any of this. So who's uh, negotiating with whom and how much has been actually put on the table? Okay, uh, let me divide it like this. There's those those who were injured and arrested who are represented by Ngoma attorneys, there's us who are representing the 36 families, um, uh, 34 who were, uh, who, were, who were murdered today on the 16th of August and then the two others who were, who were, who were murdered on the 13th. Um, we're representing those families. So for those 36, we've reached that settlement for loss of support. So that's the first head of uh, damage. The still remaining is general damages and constitutional damages. Those we're still in negotiation with. And yes, correct, the amount is about 70 million rand, give or take. So 100, um, 100 million rand, I think there was just some miscommunication, but it's definitely about 60 million, 70 million rand, sorry, for loss of support. That's the only heads of damage that we're referring to. All right, I mean, if we look at the figure that uh, the union that represents most of the workers on the platinum belt, uh, they're saying, listen, if Bishaw uh, paid out 1.7 billion rand and was an apartheid atrocity, mm -hmm. we certainly want a lot more than what we've been told. I don't think we can ever say there's enough to bring back somebody's, some, uh, somebody who's lost a loved one. There's never going to be enough that's going to say... that. So then let me come in. What about those who might say that all of this is trying to commodify the lives of uh, the miners who were lost? I would say to a great extent that is true, um, but, uh, but from our side as, as Seri, we have to follow the legal process. We have to at some point say this is an amount, this, this, is, this is it. At some point we have to reach a process of settlement because the alternative would have been to go through a direct court process where a judge would have said this this much for this person would have, everybody would have gone through a psychologist they would have been prodded to say are you are you the brother are you sister were you really connected with this person so it would have been a lot a lengthy process we six years in we would have been nowhere near where we are right now had we decided to go through a full court process and that's why we've decided to go on a process where we can try and settle with the state but i can never say that the amount that we've received is enough to bring back um, the loved ones that the widows have lost. So it's easy for us, particularly in the media, to talk about the big numbers, mm -hmm. to throw out numbers like 44 killed in those four or five days, to say 94 uh, were wounded. Uh, but just talk through what the lived experience of what uh, those families, what those widows uh, are dealing with uh, now, all these years later, with so much unresolved. I mean, uh, before I speak to what are they dealing with now, let me go back to, uh, and say what were they dealing with at the time of the massacre. You had a young wife who, after hearing of the murder, went into the hospital, stayed in the hospital. This is a mental hospital. And what happened at the same time? She was nine months pregnant. She had a miscarriage. Mm. That is the type of damage that we're talking about. You're talking about another family who, where the mother, immediately after hearing that her son had passed on in this way, immediately died. So that family that day buried two people, not just the one who died at the massacre, but the, also their mother. So we can never, ever quantify the type of damage that the, uh, the families have been in. You have people who, who have never been underground. The mothers had to now leave their families to go to Lodman to take up the position of their, that their husbands had. They had to go underground, some of them, for some months. Now only they've they said, okay, you can leave, uh, uh, leave the ground and go work up in the surface. But some of those things you can never, one can never ever say 
what are those family members that they go through. One more is one of the children as well. It's not just about the widows, the children. Um, was at boarding school, committed suicide because of the stigma of being a Marigana child. So, I mean, there's just so much. We can never, ever quantify in money or in any other way what this massacre has done to those four, 36 families, but not only those, the ones who also died the days leading up to the massacre. So, so that's the picture, that's the backstory of what happened mm -hmm. uh, six years ago. Uh, tell us about now. Where are those families now? Where those families are now, I think they're at a place where they're saying they want closure. They want the chapter to end. They want their lives to go on. I mean, I think it's a lot to have that you are known as the widow, but you are more than that. You want to be able to go to your family. You are a mother, you're a grandmother, you're a sister, you're a brother. So to live under that every year and every year, August, you have to be reminded of these incidents. To us, it's nothing. It's just playing on the TV. It's just a documentary, but they actually have to live it. And I think at this point, they want their lives to just go on. They want that apology um, from somebody coming from the government, from the president, from the minister of police to come to where they are, not just at Marikwana the Kopi, go to the homes in Eastern Cape, in Swaziland, in Lesotho, go speak to those grandfathers who lost, um, who lost their loved ones, who lost their breadwinners. Speak to them behind the cameras. Humble yourself and go speak to them. What did the playwright say? There are people living there. Zamandu Kumalo, thank you very much for coming in Pleasure. and for sharing that perspective. Of course, uh, uh, Zamandu Kumalo is uh, an attorney for those families representing their interests. Again, we ask you to send us your comments and thoughts on this story. On Twitter, our hashtag is full view. You can also send us those voice notes uh, or video commentary on uh, plus two seven six six four seven nine eight zero five six. You're watching the full view. Stay with